good morning if you're in Pacific time. Good afternoon if you are in Mountain Time or any other time zone further east. My name is Arwen, and I am very excited to be welcoming you to today's presentation, um, Alphabet Soup Plans. I am your host. Again, I'm Arwen with Advanced Benefits, and I'm very excited to take you through this presentation today. As you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the chat function um, for we will have some Q&A at the end where I can address any questions that maybe I didn't uh, were not answered during the course of the presentation. A little bit of a quick disclaimer here that this presentation is being recorded. If you do not wish to participate in a recorded call, please disconnect yourself at this time. This presentation is a courtesy service for our clients and our dear friends, and it is designed only to give general information on developments actually covered. It is not intended to be a comprehensive summary of recent developments of the law, treat exhaustively the subjects covered, provide legal advice, or render a legal opinion. Advanced benefits and employees are not attorneys or tax professionals, and we're not responsible for any legal or tax advice. To fully understand how this or any legal or compliance information affects your unique situation, you should check with a qualified attorney or tax professional. Woo! Okay, got the legalese out of the way. Love it. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So um, again, I'm Arwen with Advanced Benefits. I am the Director of Marketing here. And today I'm going to take you through um, just a quick 30 minute um, video on a high level of the different types of spendings and savings accounts that we might encounter in the course of our healthcare plan. So we're going to talk about some of the different types of accounts. We have accounts that I would classify as spending accounts. We also have accounts that I would consider to be savings. And then kind of the other accounts, right? There's a lot of different types of um, unique arrangements that are out there. And so I'm going to spend some time touching on each of those, as well as some of the rules, taxes, and retirement benefits of those plans. Okay, so... First off, we're going to talk about spending accounts. So when we're looking at a spending account, when uh, consider the name spending or the word spending is in the name of the account. So if that you see that spending, you know that these are accounts that are typically use it or lose it accounts where there is a forfeiture at the end of the year or there is only a very small percent that is able to be rolled over. And so the two types of accounts we're going to talk about in this category are going to be our flexible spending accounts and our limited purpose spending accounts. So jumping right into flexible spending accounts, what if I'm offered a, a flexible spending account or an FSA, right? This is, of course, alphabet soup after all. So there's going to be a lot of acronyms. If I'm offered an FSA in my healthcare, I'm given an opportunity to kind of um, take away some of the um, roller coaster of medical healthcare expenses, if you will. Let's a good example is think of it as like kind of like a almost a, an interest free health care, you know, loan. And so, for example, if I need to have surgery at the beginning of the year, I haven't met my deductible yet. It's not uncommon for hospitals or for surgery centers to require you to pay your deductible up front. And for some of us, that deductible might be two, three, four, five thousand dollars. And that can be a lot for one person at once. And so in that situation, if that was what I was facing, I would sign up for a FSA. So let's say in this example, I'm going to go in for surgery and the surgery center wants $2,000 up front. I would elect $2,000 to sign up for my FSA. And what that's going to allow me to do is on day one of the plan, I'm going to have a debit a card or access to an account that has the $2,000 ready and waiting for me to access. And then when I go into the surgery center, I swipe that card and pay the full $2,000 and I go on my merry way to have surgery. However, over the course of the next 12 months, my payroll, my paycheck is going to be deducted 
to pay that back. And so rather than put something like that on a credit card where you're paying high interest or it compounds and it's harder and harder to pay off that balance. Um, it's an opportunity for you to spread out your medical expenses over the course of the entire year. So it takes that roller coaster of healthcare spent expenses and it flattens it out for you so that you can make it much more manageable for you, your finances for the course of the year. Of course, there are some nuances. Health uh, and a healthcare FSA is good for some things and is not good for other things. And so I say that an FSA is generally good for known expenses. Because it is a spending account, it's my goal to have the money spent by the end of the year. And so I know, again, these are things I know about. I know I have to have a surgery. I know that I need to pay co-pays for regular appointments. I know that I have a prescription that I fill every month and it is maybe a $45 copay. Things that you can count on because again, you wanna make sure that that balance is spent by the end of the year. Another good use for an FSA is things that may not necessarily be covered by the insurance, but are considered a qualified expense under the FSA. So an example of that might be LASIK surgery. LASIK surgery, um, I don't know that I've ever seen a, a healthcare plan that covers LASIK surgery, but it's something that is qualified under an FSA and usually they're kind of spendy. And so those are the kind of things that it helps open up um, doors for you for your, your um, healthcare to be able to have something covered without paying it, you know, like a giant out of pocket all at once or putting it on a credit card or something like that. An FSA is not necessarily as good of a choice for somebody that is trying, that doesn't have planned expenses and has it just in case. What happens in those situations is we see people that signed up for a, you know, 1,000, 2,000, even, you know, $3,000 FSA, and they get to the end of the year and they find out that they have one week to spend all of that money before it's forfeited. Again, it's a use it or lose it account. And then you're spending, you know, you're, you're, you're going to the FSA store and you're buying things like band-aids or crutches. And that's not a meaningful use of your dollars, right? That's dollars that probably would have been better kept in your paycheck that could have gone to your savings account or, or household expenses, that sort of thing. So again, not necessarily as effective or efficient for unplanned what-if expenses. Now, it's important to note that a health FSA can be used for medical, dental, and vision expenses. So again, it's great for things like LASIK surgery. Um, braces, orthodontia is a great use for it. Not all um, dental plans cover orthodontia. Okay, and then on the other side of the coin, we you may be offered a limited purpose or LPFSA. Now think of what I just talked about for the healthcare FSA, and we're gonna slice out, we're gonna carve out medical. Right. So an, a limited purpose FSA is an FSA that is only for dental or vision expenses. And so this is um, something that, you know, I needed to think to myself, OK, do I know that I have uh, crowns or um, eye surgery that's coming up? Do I know that I have things like glasses, contact lenses, braces, that sort of thing. And it works just like the healthcare FSA where I am I decide how much I want for the year. It's ready to be spent on day one. And over the course of the next 12 months, my paycheck pays that back. So again, it takes the roller coaster of your dental and vision expenses and flattens it out for you. So again, what, when is an LPFSA a good fit? When is it maybe not a good fit? And what do we need to know about it? So again, good for your known expenses. If you know you're going to buy a box of contacts, get glasses, maybe you're going to get prescription sunglasses, right? And your vision benefit only covers one pair of frames, but you want glasses and sunglasses, right? Good use for that. When it comes to your... Um, Excuse me one second. 
All right. When it comes to things like dental copays, again, um, it's really great for orthodontia, but bad for it. If you sign up for a limited purpose FSA with the intention of using it for healthcare expenses, you're going to be sorely disappointed because it's going to go, it's going to deny and decline and say, this is not a qualified expense. This is a really good plan to be paired with an F, a, a high deductible health plan with an HSA, which I'll talk about um, in just in the next slide. But again, if you are wanting to have a specific account set aside for dental and vision expenses, this is a really great opportunity for that. But it follows the same rules where it has use it or lose it and um, that you want to make sure that it's spent by the end of the year. Let's talk about savings accounts. So there's different types of accounts that, again, have different you know, names. If it has the word savings in it, it's probably, you know, what the strongest one that you're going to want to take the closest look at. When you're talking about a savings account, those are designed for your balances to grow every single year, for money to be saved up, and for your balances to roll over. There's no use it or lose it or forfeiture aspect to a savings account. And it also has opportunities for your balances to grow through potential investment opportunities. So we're going to talk about a health savings account or an HSA. An HSA is a very special type of account that you can use to set money aside for those potential medical expenses. So when we talked about with the um, the flexible spending account, that's not a great vehicle for the what if. This is the vehicle for the what if, right? We know that when we drive cars and we use our vehicles, we know that it's a good idea. I think the rule of thumb that my dad taught me was for every mile I drive, I should put 10 cents into my savings account for maintenance costs, right? We know as adults that we need to set money aside for maintenance, for the what if situations. Our bodies are no different. We also need maintenance for our bodies, for um, you know things that could potentially happen or services that we potentially need for like a broken arm or a surgery. And so this gives you that opportunity to do so. It's an individually owned account, which means it belongs to you. You, if you leave your organization, it follows you, you know, around. It is your money, your account. It, it belongs to you. The um, FSA, um, or excuse me, see, alphabet soup plans. It's so easy to get these acronyms mixed up. There's just an example, case in point. With a health savings account, with an HSA specifically, both employers and employees can contribute to it, and it is designed for those potential medical expenses. So you, um, again, the whether an employer contributes to an HSA is really going to depend on your organization. Um, that's something that, you know, may or may not be a feature, but it's something that some employers look at when they're considering, you know, hey, you know, how else can we increase um, recruitment or retention, or you may have a spouse that has that feature. And it's something to keep in mind when you're looking and evaluating your HSA options. All right, let's talk about some of the details of a health savings account. Again, really great for unknown healthcare expenses. I encourage everybody that has a HSA to consider you know, depending on your financial situation, of course, you know your financial situation better than anybody, to make sure that you're contributing something to that account. You will never be sorry that you have this account with some money in it when the time comes that you need it. So you may be in a financial situation where you can only put $10 every paycheck into that account. Maybe it's 25 50, 75, 100. If you have the opportunity to contribute to an HSA, put something in there. Because like I said, you will never be upset when the time comes where you need to go to the urgent care that you have the money already set aside to pay for those medical bills. Again, for every year that you don't fully spend the balance, it just rolls over from one year to the next. I've had my HSA account for 12 years now, and there have been some years where I haven't spent a penny because I haven't needed to. I haven't I needed, you know, healthcare services beyond my preventive exam or my, you know, preventive medication. And the full balance just chunked right over into the next year. 
there have been years where I've had surprise expenses. This is one of those years where my husband ended up in the hospital for needing surgery. And I was able to use my health savings account to pay for those expenses because I've been saving up for years and years for the what if something happens. And so it helped reduce a lot of the financial stress in my household. It's also a great vehicle saving for retirement, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the retirement aspect of it. But what I really appreciate about it is, as you know, I'm a, I'm younger um, as far as like you know, looking at the the workforce is concerned. I'm in my 30s, and so I am thinking to myself, now is a really good time for me to set money aside for retirement. I'm trying to really aggressively fund my retirement account, and the health savings account is an extension of your retirement benefits. When you put money into your HSA, that money can be used for you know future expenses. And so when I am 65 and I retire, and you know, if I receive my and I start, you know, getting my retirement benefits start to pay out or social security, I want to use that money for my lifestyle. I want to use it to go on cruises or golfing or things like that. I don't want to have to use my retirement benefits to pay for Medicare premiums. That sounds lame. And so I have my HSA and I'm thinking to myself, I want to fund as much as I can into my HSA because that's the account that I'm going to use to pay for my Medicare premiums. So it's also a helpful potential retirement vehicle. And then it's also good for someone that has really dynamic family needs. You can use your HSA dollars for anybody that you can claim on your taxes as a taxable dependent. And so you may have a spouse that has benefits elsewhere or kiddos that are enrolled under your spouse, but you can still use your HSA dollars to pay for their potential um, expenses. Now, the caveat there is that you can only contribute to a health savings account if you are enrolled in a high deductible health plan. That's the trade-off. And so if you are not enrolled in a high deductible health plan, think of it as a gate, right? The gates are closed. You are not permitted to put new money into a health savings account. If you were on a high deductible health plan and you have an HSA with some money in it and you switch away from a high deductible health plan, you don't lose your HSA. Um, you still have access to it. It just means that the gates are closed. You can't put any new money into it, but you continue. You can continue to spend money out of it until the balance reaches zero. And so that's a question I get asked a lot for someone that's considering moving away from a high deductible health plan is they don't want to lose their HSA and that will not happen. It actually follows you around. You could always spend money out of it. It's just whether or not you can put money into it is dependent on what kind of plan you're enrolled in. Now, it's also important to note that the gates I talked about open or shut on whether or not you can put new money into it. The gates are also shut if you have double coverage. And so if you are, if you have secondary insurance, like for example, Medicare, if you have uh, Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B, maybe um, you're a former military and you receive benefits from the VA, maybe you're in the reserves and you have TRICARE or tribal services, that sort of thing. If you have double coverage, the gates are also closed to you. And so just keep that in mind is when you're planning for retirement, um, you're automatically enrolled in that Medicare Part A coverage. And so there is a limited time window that you have to put money into that HSA bank account. Okay, there are a host of other types of accounts that employers may offer that might be part of your benefits package. I'm going to talk about two of the most common ones that we see um, as part of an employee's benefits plan. There are a lot of accounts out there. There's accounts like VBAs, mass transit accounts, that sort of thing, but they're not as common in our area um, in the Pacific Northwest and specifically in Idaho. And so we're going to talk about, again, the other most common ones that we see. But just know that if you have questions about um, a type of account that we did not talk about here today, that that's something that we can talk you through if you have further questions. So these other accounts are designed, they're put in place by employers who recognize that you have maybe a specific need for um, assistance, financial assistance with maybe healthcare or dependent care expenses. And so there are different types of accounts that serve essentially as tax vehicles to be able to provide that additional support. So the first one we're going to talk about is the health reimbursement arrangement, also called an HRA. 
These are less and less common. These used to be really, really popular before the Affordable Care Act came out. Um, I've seen them less and less, but it may be something that either your employer still offers or it's something that you've heard about or maybe your spouse, um, their benefits have an HRA. And so I think it's good for you to be aware of how these work in case you were to encounter them. But if you're like, I've never heard of that, I've never seen it, it's not part of our benefits plan, that's not entirely surprising because they are less popular than they used to be. So an HRA is specifically designed to reimburse you for specific expenses. You know, a lot of employers use them to reimburse deductible expenses. And the benefit of that is in um, previously, before the ACA came out, it was really common for the larger your deductible was, the less expensive the, the premiums were, right? How much does it cost just to have the insurance? And so what would happen is um, employers would um, get a plan that had a higher deductible, maybe a five or a $6,000 deductible, but, you know, not wanting employees or individuals to have to, you know, have the financial burden of that much of a deductible, um, some employers would put an HRA in place, which means that you could get reimbursed for a certain dollar amount of your medical expenses. So, you know, it might be two or three thousand dollars to say, hey, if you have expenses that go to your deductible, submit this information and you will be reimbursed for that. So then that way um, it's essentially your deductible was bought down to a lower amount so that you didn't feel the full brunt of that. Again, it's less common now because there's not as much savings to be had by purchasing a higher deductible and deductibles are just higher in general nowadays. Um, so again, it's less common than we used to see. But again, you might stumble across them every once in a while. So an HRA is um, really good for individuals that have spe a qualified specifics, um, qualified expenses under the plan. So again, the employers are the ones that put in place, okay, this is going to be reimbursed for deductible expenses, or this is going to be reimbursed for prescriptions. Um, in the plan design, they establish this is what this will reimburse essentially. And it is a, a more complex plan to be engaged with. There's usually paperwork involved, right? You have to submit your receipts or you have to submit copies of your EOBs to the third party administrator. So it, it re uh, requires a greater understanding and more involvement with how to use this plan and how to be reimbursed. And so if you would pref if you prefer things to be on autopilot and, um, you know, you're like, nah, uh, this isn't for me, then that's probably not a good fit. And it's important to note, too, that HRAs are considered self-funded by employers. So they are subject to greater scrutiny and regulations. And so there is more paperwork involved because the likelihood of it being audited is, is much higher. And so if you've you ever um, experienced or use an HRA and you ever thought to yourself, man, they ask for so much paperwork from me or receipts and this is ridiculous. That's why is it subject to greater scrutiny by the different government agencies. The other plan we're going to talk about is the Dependent Care Assistance Program, also called a DCAP. And that is help to, um, it is a, a vehicle that employers can offer to help lower employees' taxable income while paying for daycare or for caregivers. And so if you have a um, children under the age of 13 that are needing, um, you know, that you're paying for um, babysitting before, after school care, nanny expenses, daycare, um, you know, like preschool or summer day camps, that sort of thing. Um, and again, they're under the age of 13. You have an opportunity, like, let's say you're going to spend $500 um, I would say, let's call it a thousand. We're going to spend a thousand dollars on daycare every month. What you can do is you can say, I want a thousand dollars a month to go into my DCAP. And what that does is it takes the, the money out of your paycheck, plunks it into this DCAP, and then you can turn around and pay for your daycare out of this account. And what it does is it lowers your taxable income. And so it is something that it's going to something that you're probably going to pay anyways, but by having that taxable income reduced, there are some greater savings. 
It's also something that can be used for individuals that have relatives who are physically or mentally incapable of caring themselves. Um, it's really important to know that there are really strict definitions under the IRS on who is considered a qualified dependent, and they do have to meet those definitions, especially if they are over the age of 13. But a great example that I've encountered is somebody who had a child who was an adult who was a quadriplegic. And so they were able to, um, you know, use that dependent care account to, um, you know, provide the, to pay for the um, caregiver that came and cared for that adult child while they were at work. It's not necessarily a good fit for individuals where the caretakers are family members. There are strict rules about, hey, if this is like your parent or an aunt or an uncle, like, they, you know, that's not something that's qualified. And then there are instances where caretakers caretakers are under the table um, where it's, you know, like a neighbor or somebody and it's just like a cash arrangement. And the reason it's not a good fit is because in order to use your dependent care account, you have to um, essentially provide the IRS when you submit your all your paperwork with the either if it's an individual, it's their social security number of who's receiving your funds out of your dependent care account, or if it's a business, it's their tax ID number. And so if someone's doing this under the table, that's not going to be a good fit because it's not going to hold up on the paperwork side. It's also important to note that there is a child care tax credit um, and again, I'm not a tax professional. I would encourage you to seek a tax professional's assistance with this. But I, it's my understanding that there's also, there's two versions. You can either do the DCAP or there's a tax credit that you can claim at the end of the year. And um, it's best to check with your tax professional on which is better for you and which would maximize your tax savings and reduce your tax liability. All right, so let's talk about the rules, taxes, and retirement benefits. And so because these accounts are governed by the IRS, of course, there's rules on how much can I contribute to each of these accounts, what are the maximums, what are the limits, what can I spend the money on, and what other rules do I need to be aware of? So when it comes to the IRS, um, essentially for the healthcare FSA, the limited purpose um, uh, FSA, as well as your health FSA, HSA, see, I'm telling you alph alphabet soup, lots of letters. Um, that is governed by IRS code 213D, where they say, okay, this is qualified, this is qualified, this is not qualified. An example would be um, a dental cleaning is qualified. Teeth whitening is not qualified because it's considered cosmetic. That's an example. Um, certain things like HRAs, um, they employers will follow the 213D guidelines, and sometimes they'll be more specific of like, oh, this is only for prescriptions, and that is allowed under HRAs. Um, again, for most of these accounts, you can use them for anybody in your household who's considered a qualified um, taxable dependent. HRAs may be the exception to that. Those accounts may only be allowed to be used for employees and not for dependents. And for some of these accounts, especially things like FSAs um, or your HRAs, you do need to substantiate your bills. And so it's not uncommon to work with a third party administrator that says, hey, we need a copy of your receipt that shows that you spent, you know, we, especially for the dentist, right? You went to the dentist, we need a receipt showing, an itemized receipt showing that it was a cleaning and not teeth whitening. And again, a lot of these accounts are managed by third party administrators. I've seen administrators like Health Equity, EBC. Um, there are uh, Navia, there are a host of companies out there that employers will partner with to provide these benefits, to run the debit card, to do a 1-800 number, that sort of thing. And again, because these are governed by the IRS, there are maximums on how much money can I put into these accounts each year. Now, it's important to note that these maximums change, um, frequently change from year to year. And so um, it's something that they tweak and they adjust based off of things like inflation, the CPI, that sort of thing. As of this recording, which is 2024, um, the health FSA limit is $3,200. And you can only roll over up to $640 if that's a feature in your account. So again, when I say it's a use it or lose it account, you can only roll over 20% of those funds. So you want to make sure it's spent down. And that applies for the limited purpose um, uh, FSA as well. 
for your dependent care, if you are um, filing as single, the maximum that you can put in your dependent care account in 2024 is $2,500 or $5,000 if you um, are married and file a joint return. And then for the health savings account um, for 2024, the maximum that you can put into that account, and that's a combined effort. If your employer contributes to your HSA as well, then that it's the total amount of uh, contributions. It doesn't really matter how you get there. It's just there's, that's the total cap. For an HSA, if you're enrolled just by yourself, that's uh, $4,150. And if you are enrolled with at least one other family member, that amount is $8,300. And if you're over the age of 55, there is a catch-up um, provision where you can put an extra $1,000 because they know you're getting close to retirement age when the gates shut and they're no longer able to make contributions. Again, um, these benefits are tax advantaged. And so if you um, use these, they actually actually lower your taxable income. And so as you can see here, there is um, some information on, you can see if you're contributing to an HSA account, as an example, you pay $190 in this example for taxes. Whereas if you don't, you pay $200 in taxes. And so there are some tax advantages to be had when you are contributing to these types of accounts. Um, like I said, I touched on earlier, there are also some retirement benefits with the HSAs, and so you can grow your balances. It becomes a piggy bank for your future medical expenses, and it's one of the very few accounts that you can use to pay for some Medicare expenses, such as Part B premiums. So keep in mind that it is an excellent retirement vehicle as well. This is, um, of course, you will receive a copy of the slide deck after um, the, this presentation. This is your cheat sheet. If you take anything away from this conversation, I want you to take away this cheat sheet that you are able to use to reference later as you're trying to navigate the alphabet soup of all these different plants. And again, my name is Arwen. I hope you found this information to be helpful as far as all the different type of alphabet soup plans that you may encounter in your employee benefits package. Um, I know we had some questions in the chat um, throughout the course of the presentation, but if you have any other questions, you are more than welcome to enter them into the chat now. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Again, I hope you found this information to be helpful and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.